Hello, my guest now is Burgess Owens. He, was, he played the, with the Super Bowl champs, the Oakland Raiders, when they won in 1981. He is in, running for Congress in the 4th District of Utah, which is where he used to play football. We're just thank you so much for being here. You grew up in the Deep South, so tell me about the, the culture there and what it was like. I grew up uh, in Tallahassee, Florida in the 60s, uh, the days of KKK, Jim Crow, segregation, in a very, very uh, positive environment. Uh, our community was very successful. Uh, the, the entrepreneur was everywhere. Uh, we had uh, education was a, was a highlight, was a focus for our community at that time, respect for authority, women, God. So I grew up in a time when uh, I was just very proud to have come out of that community. I went to University of Miami, I was the third black to go to University of Miami, where I got a biology degree. Uh, and it's because the expectations of our community were so high in those days. So when I left the game in uh, 83, I realized that we were going on the wrong track. We were, we were going in the wrong direction. And I thought was, was always to some kind of way reach back and help young kids, particularly those at risk, to realize the American dream was alive and well. And that's what I've been doing the last couple of years in Utah. And I realized about nine months ago that um, unless we get our house back, uh, our kids don't have a chance, not only in Utah, but across our country, because it's the policies of the left that's put them in that position. And I truly believe that those at risk, those who have no hope today, will be some of the strongest advocates for our American way, because they will get it. So I decided to run for the seat now that's, that's now being held by Democrat Ben McAdams. It's a very deep uh, red district, District 4, uh, plus 13. There's no way we should not keep that seat. As a matter of fact, it's between number one and three in terms of must-have for both the Democrats to keep the House and for us to win back our country. So for those who listen to our, our, our conversation, go to Burgess for the number four Utah.com and you see what we're going to do to get our, our seat back, our house back, and, and, and uh, represent our, our country well. So you, you were growing up in, in very pretty volatile times. Yes. Yeah. And it was... Uh... Uh, a time when there were, there were tensions, and but you said it was your community was strong. You know, it's interesting because uh, one of the things that uh, that Karl Marx said back in the 1800s was that the first battleground is the writing of history. If we truly understood our history and what we the people have done, we'll realize that every culture, every people, every individual comes to this country and lives the American way will experience the American dream. The American way comes down to, uh, and I call it the four tenets: head, heart, hands, and home education, God, industry, and family. Those tenets was, was thriving in the black communities throughout the first part of the 1900s. The 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the black community led our country in the growth of the middle class. Men committed to marriage, over 70 percent. Entrepreneurs, over 40 percent. And men matriculated from college. So that is truly made it the most competitive minority race in our country. And I lived the American dream. I was the part of that middle class. My cousins across the country were. And then in the 1960s, we flipped it because we lost uh, the focus on those four tenets. We allowed the socialists and Marxists to come in and, and devalue the family unit, devalue womanhood and manhood, and all that changed the way things are, are going in the direction now. Can you give some examples from your memory? What, was, what changed people's thinking? What, what changed, and I can kind of, kind, of, kind of give you an idea of how we got there. Example, my parents were a good example. My dad served in World War II, came back, and. Uh, because he grew up in, in Texas, was not allowed to go to postgraduate work. Uh, when he passed away, I ran across a box, a, a, a box of letters, rejection letters from colleges across the country. And that generation didn't, lose, didn't use that as a negative. It was a motivation. It motivated him to go to Ohio State, where he got his PhD, end up being a, a very successful college professor for 40 years, entrepreneur, a researcher. We traveled the world. When I was five years old, I lived in Liberia, Africa, because he was doing research there. My, one of my oldest uncles in 1960, days of segregation, owned a, a, little, pub, a little, little private plane. Uh, that's his part-time business was, was taking mail from Utah, from, from, sorry, from Texas to Chicago, because entrepreneurship was everything in our community in those days. My experience, very simply, and I remember uh, our focus was edu edu about education. Uh, it was, it was the, the doorway to success for the black community, as it is today, that our kids are educated, that we can think, we can be critical thinkers, we come up with solutions. We think about how can we begin a business, or how can one day sit behind a camera like you are right now and actually follow your dream. That was the American way that we believed in, and we lost that when we allowed our country, our community, to, to turn around and, and think in a different direction. What were the forces that uh, shifted that? The forces, very simply, were those, who, those forces that goes against those four tenets. When you stop teaching our kids how to think, when education is used as a propaganda tool to, to, to go against our country, our culture, 
when you uh, we take God out of every facet of our lives, and that's one thing about our country, the Judeo-Christian values has made our country the great country it is, that we can look at each other from inside out, not outside in. The left hates God, and therefore, as we pull him out, we begin to look at each other from outside in versus inside out. So that's, why, that's how you get a, an increase of racism, when people are not looking at each other for the value and the content. Every American should have the opportunity to work, to pursue their dreams, to understand what meritocracy is. You work harder than the next guy. You one day own a business if you want to do that. The left doesn't believe in that, we do. My community of 40% 40, 40 of entrepreneurs has gone down to 3.2%. My community of 70% of men committed to marriage has gone down to 30%. Those tenets that really define our country, our our progress through the middle class has been destroyed within the black community. The family unit, which start off with men committed to their kids, their, 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 the mother of the kids, they're, they're making sure that the next generation is better than what they've done. Those things have changed over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, and that's why I'm excited about getting that back. I, I love the fact that we the people are coming together now. Do you see that coming back in the, <coughs> there's in no, the black community? There's no question. And I'll say this, coming back because we have a president who cares more about the American people, about uh, their dream for American people, than, than power, politics, or, or money. He could care less about that. So we have success. And anything, one thing about the American way, when people get jobs, when people can go out to work, when they can start having discretionary income, when they can buy a home, they can say, you know, I'm going to take this, this route to have my own business. My kid's going to have a better future because I can provide that. That gives us a, a, a sense of pride in who we are. That's what's coming back again the lowest unemployment in the history of black community, Hispanic community, Asian community, veterans, young kids, 400% increase in job ownership in the first two years in the black community. That is powerful. When all of a sudden somebody can look in the mirror and say, you know what, I can control my life. I'm gonna take a risk. If I fail, I'll figure out how to get over it again. That's the American way. And that's because of a president who's quite different than the ones we've had before, because we haven't promises but not come through. Well, I, I can say this, <clears throat> that, that, I, that I love about where we are today. Uh, one thing about those of us as we begin to focus on what we have in common, our flag we have in common, no matter where we come from, we should protect and appreciate the, the sacrifice of those who came before us. When we become a team that, that represents, that, that respects our flag, respects our, our culture, that will do whatever we have to do to protect our own homes, then we kind of start looking past the things that separate us. I played with the Super Bowl, Super Bowl champions, Oakland Raiders. I can tell you what was unique about that team. We weren't that we were the youngest, the fastest. Uh, many of us were older, had gone through from other teams. But we had a culture in which we wanted to make sure we did not let each other down. It didn't care what color we were, it didn't care what other team we had come from, what college. We wanted to make sure that I did my job and my teammates knew they can depend on me to do, that I was gonna do my job. That kind of unity allows us to truly look at the value, the content of each other, and respect each other because of it. And here we are 40, 50 years later, not 50, years later, decades later, some of my best relationships to those guys that I fought through that fight that year, and we put aside all the differences, and we came together and won a Super Bowl game. That's what America's about to do again. Just win, baby, and I look forward to making that happen. Thank you. Um, were you ever a victim of, uh, of, of antagonism or hostility? Yeah, I was the, uh, if you remember the movie, Remember the Titans, I don't know if you've seen that movie. I've heard the name, yeah. Okay, you need to see it. All right. All right. It's, a, it's a classic. But I was one of the first four blacks uh, that uh, went into this all-white high school, Rickers High. Mm -hmm. I was also the, the third black to get a scholarship at the University of Miami. Uh, I grew up during a time when segregation, the walls were breaking down. Mm -hmm. So I know how racism looks. Uh, I remember uh, having a, a guy on my team that was a remarkable athlete, a remarkable, older, stronger, but he just didn't like black people. And I remember my dad uh, telling me how to deal with bullies. That's what we did during those days. Dad would talk to their sons and daughters. How do you deal with people who don't like you? First of all, don't become who, what they are. That was the advice of my mother. Don't let someone else uh, dictate who your, your attitudes will be. And that was a very important lesson. But here's a me lesson for my dad, is when you're dealing with bullies, you run at them as fast as you can and hit them as hard as you can. That is what President Trump is doing. And it takes a decision, because you don't know how it's gonna end. You have no idea. You have to have the faith eventually it's gonna work out okay. It just so happens that the, the guy that was our biggest bullies when I was in high school, we ended up playing in an all-star game together in college at the end of our career. And sitting in a room of, uh, after practice, all black guys, he comes in, he's the only white guy, sitting down and he, he felt right in because he had grown up. 
That's what Americans do. Give us time, give us a chance to have these kind of conversations. And we realize that there's no difference in, in us. There really is no difference. And that's how we get past the, the, the division that the left wants to have us in that, go in that direction. What do you say about the idea that's promoted heavily that racism is the really the problem for the blacks today and we need to get rid of it and blah, blah, blah? Um, well, you're hearing that from racists. You're hearing that, that uh, narrative from people who do nothing but look at each other from outside in. They look at a black person and say, this is what you should be doing. This is, this is the, the length of your, your potential. Uh, matter of fact, you're such an oppressed race that we, the white people, need to apologize for who we are. That is racism to its core. No, we're a country that from the very beginning allowed we, the people, to go after our dreams. I just talked about 40, 50 years in which the black community was succeeding. That can only happen in this country. There's never been a stronger middle class in the entire world than what's happening in this country, in every single segment out there. Um, so no, just understand there's a narrative that divides us, a narrative that not, does not want to teach our, our American history, the same narrative that does not want us to, to worship God. That's the left, the Marxist, communist, socialist on the left. So don't believe them. Uh, what you do is look around and see, see who, who's helping, who's mentoring, who's giving, who's donating, and you find it has no color. It's people who have good hearts. And that's where we need to get back to realizing it's from inside out that makes Americans who we are, not outside in. And I just want to add too, because I come from a very liberal family and I know that a lot of what motivates those people also is a, a deep concern and a care and a big heart. But it, again, the, the narrative that they're operating from has been framed in such a way that uh, it's dividing people. Can I, can I say the answer to that? Because I, I totally get it. My, my family is also very liberal. Mm -hmm. Good hearts, and I love them dearly. This is what we have to understand. There's two ways of approaching people who are, who are in need. One is through, through sympathy, and the other one is through empathy. Sympathy is very superficial. And sympathy doesn't allow us to really feel the pain we had to, we're taking a, a, a look and looking, kind of looking down and we can pull people out. Empathy is we get in there, we serve to the point where we realize, I know exactly how you feel. I, 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 I walk your shoes. I know it is to feel poverty or feel depression. Or, uh, we, we understand the feeling and therefore we walk hand by hand and work them way through and not feel that we're in such a position we can pull people out. So I'll, I'll suggest for good people out there who might be listening to us, let's work on empathy. Go out and serve. Really pull up your sleeve. Don't just throw money at the problem. Pull up your, roll up your sleeve. Go out there and help somebody who's trying to get through a bad educational system. Someone who's trying to overcome uh, not having a, a good start with their, their, go to prison, whatever it is. Work in those environments and you'll find out what empathy looks like. And we will come up with the policies that will help people to win and not feel sorry for them. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this conversation and I think it will hopefully bring a lot, of, a lot more unity. Thank you. Well, that's, that's our goal. And that's what America's all about. We do people do the best once we wake up and find out that's what, what, what we're trying to get done. So thank you, June, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much.